So, I've got a lot of material to get through, so you might as well go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to be talking about KELT, which is a low latency, high quality audio codec. Um, this is a project started by Jean-Marc Belen, who was the creator of Speaks. And we've been working on this basically for the past year with, with Gregory Maxwell and myself. And just a basic outline of the talk, I'm going to talk about why we would want to do such a thing, and then, then talk about the, the design of KELT and the library that we've implemented KELT in, give a demo and a brief conclusion. So, why would we want to create another audio codec? There are two common types of lossy audio codecs. One are, are the, the speech codecs, which are, are used for communication. So you have the GSM codecs, AMR codecs, speaks, etc. These all operate with low delays in the range of 15 to 30 milliseconds and low sampling rates, which means they're basically low quality. So this is the kind of stuff you would, you would have in your, your phone. And there's, there's really no support for music at all. These codecs do not encode music well. On the other hand, there are general purpose codecs like MP3 or AAC or Vorbis. And these all have high delays, so they require hundreds of, of milliseconds of audio before they hand you back a single byte of, of compressed data. But on the other hand, they operate at high sampling rates, you know, 40, 44 kilohertz that you'd find on CDs. And so th they encode music very well and, and generally give you high quality audio. So KELT is designed to fit in the gap between these two. So we want both high fidelity and very low delay so that we can use these for, for communication while still maintaining CD quality audio. So why is low delay so important? Well, it does a number of things for you. Uh, for example, it prevents collisions during a conversation or reduces the need for echo cancellation. So if you have a live system where with two-way communication, your, your microphone will pick up the audio from your own speakers. And so you can do what's known as echo cancellation to detect that and filter that out of the signal. But that's expensive to do on very small embedded devices and uses lots of battery power. So if you can get away without doing that, if you get the delay low enough, it basically just sounds like a little bit of added reverb and it's not so bad. So low delay helps that. It, it basically gives you a higher sense of presence. So if, if you have you know, a video conferencing, if you've ever, if, if, if you've ever done video conferencing, you're, you've never been able to confuse that for being in the same room with another person. I mean, it's always obvious that there's a big delay between you and them. And so this helps to eliminate that and make it seem more like you're really having a real conversation with somebody else. The, the other thing it helps with is performing live music. And so this is, this is something that people are actually starting to try to do now in the sense that you have two different performers at remote locations both playing together. And if you can keep the delay low enough, they can actually do that and keep in perfect sync. So for example, if you have a high delay, it's very hard to, it's very hard to synchronize with your fellow performer like this. Oops, forgot to plug in the audio. <laughs> Time. Roll, 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 roll your boat, boat gently, gently down, down the stream. stream. Merry, 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 life is but a dream. dream. <laughs> right, so you can see that didn't work very well, and that's with about a quarter second of delay. So now if you listen to it with 15 milliseconds of delay. Roll, roll, roll your boat gently down the stream. Merry, merrily, 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 life is but a dream you can see that both people can actually sing at the same time. And so the, the limit winds up being at around 25 milliseconds of total delay. So that's including everything, including the codec, the sound, 
card, your, your network buffer, and everything else, which at the speed of sound is equivalent to sitting about eight meters apart. Any farther than that, and it requires a conductor. So if you've ever seen a marching band, or a, they all have to, to look at their conductor and not listen to what they're not listen to what the guys around them sound like. And that, that's very difficult to do as a musician. Yes? Um, that's one way, yes. So the, the lower delay in your codec you have increases the amount of range you can do these distributed network performances. So at the speed of light, one, millis one millisecond winds up being about 200 kilometers. Which in fiber, which fiber doesn't quite get you the speed of light; it gets you somewhere around 0.8 c. But that—that's roughly the conversion factor. So every one millisecond we can shave off the codec delay means we can have performers that are 200 kilometers farther apart. So there's actually no entrenched standard codec that that meets all the requirements to do this sort of thing. Um, there's a couple of codecs that are sort of aiming at this space. Uh, the first one here is G7221C, also known as Siren. Uh, that gives you about 40 milliseconds of delay, which is clearly not enough for, for live music. And it doesn't quite give you CD quality audio, because so it only goes up to 32 kilohertz sampling rate. But it comes pretty close. Um, there's also a low delay version of AAC called AACLD. And that, that gives you 20 to, to 50 milliseconds of delay, which is getting in the right range, but it's still difficult for when you add the sound card and the network and all that other stuff to keep that, that delay under 25 milliseconds. You, you find that your range would be very limited. But it does give you CD quality audio, so it actually does go all, all the way up to 48 kilohertz. And finally, the only codec that really operates at the, the same space as Kelt is this codec called ULD for ultra low delay. This is done by uh, the Fraunhofer people, so the same people who did MP3. And that gives you less than 10 milliseconds of delay at CD quality audio. But as we'll see in listening tests later, we sound much better than they do at, at equivalent bit rates. So Kelt is already ahead of basically all of these codecs. So we're much more configurable. Uh, our delay can range anywhere down to 1.3 milliseconds up to 24 milliseconds. The lower delay you have, the, the more bits you need. Yes? What's the trade-off? Is it the compression? Right, yeah. So as I said, the lower, lower delay you have, the more bits you're, you have to get to spend to get the same quality. But we, we find at around 8 milliseconds, you know, you, you get a, a decent result. Um, our quality at, at the same bit rate winds up being much better than Siren, and it's about as good as, as AAC, though at lower bit rates we do slightly better. And we're much better than ULD. Um, and we operate at a much wider range of bit rates. So all the way from down at 24 kilobits per second up to over 160 kilobits per second. We also operate you know, with a, a wider range of, of sampling rates. And you can configure what delay you want. And you, there's also a low complexity mode, so you can use it on very small devices without much CPU. Um, and of course, as, as all ZIF codecs, KELT is, is open source and, is, as far as we know, has no patents in covering it. So now I want to talk a little bit about the design of the codec. So the, the CELT in KELT stands for Constrained Energy Lapped Transform. The LT, the lap transform part, uh, corresponds to the, the fact that this is a transform codec, so it, it's the same basic idea as MP3 or Vorbis or any of the other general purpose codecs. Um, the difference is, is that we use very short windows, so instead of requiring hundreds of milliseconds of audio, we require about you know, five to eight milliseconds of audio. But the trade-off there is, is you get poor frequency resolution, and I'll describe exactly what that means in a moment. But the, the big idea behind KELT is the CE part, this constrained energy. And what that means is that we're going to explicitly, in the bitstream, code how much energy is used in each band of the signal. So we're going to chop the signal up into bands, figure out how much energy is in there, and code that in the stream. And then on the decoder side, 
we'll make sure whatever signal we reconstruct from our compressed bitstream, it has exactly that much energy in it. And what that allows you to do is, is conceal a lot of blatantly obvious artifacts that show up in things like MP3 that don't do this. Uh, so the, after we do that, the, there's a few more things that didn't quite make it into the name. Um, we use vector quantization to, to code the details beyond just the energy. Um, and we also use a pitch predictor, which is, is similar to the linear prediction used by speech codecs, but different in some of the details. And that helps compensate for our poor frequency resolution in our transform. So now I'm going to talk about some of those in more detail. And then I'll give you some performance results of, of how well we actually sound. So in order to talk about the, the lap transform, I need to explain the idea of time frequency duality. So if, if you don't understand this, the rest of the talk is going to go right over your head. So do this up front. The basic idea is that any signal can be represented as a weighted sum of cosine curves uh, oscillating at different frequencies. So if you look at the curve on the left here, just, just looks like some random curve. I can actually break it down into three cosine curves on the right, each one oscillating at a different frequency and with a different amplitude. And so I know I can do that because I constructed the curve on the left myself. I mean, it's got two, two A tones about an octave apart and then a D sharp an octave and a half above that. But if I didn't know that in advance, the discrete cosine transform is a mathematical tool that tells you what frequency the energy in your signal is concentrated at. So if I computed the discrete cosine transform of that curve on the left, you get something like this, where I have three sharp peaks that correspond to the frequency of those three tones. And the, the size of the peak is, is the amplitude of that, of that curve that I added in there. And everywhere else, you get zeros. But the discrete in DCT means that we're looking at a finite number of audio samples and converting that into amplitudes at a finite number of frequencies. So you're, as you look at more and more audio, you get better and better frequency resolution because you're, you're, you have more finely spaced cosine curves. But as you get smaller and smaller block sizes, the energy that was concentrated in these nice sharp peaks starts to leak into some of the surrounding bins. So before I'd used a full second of audio, which gave me frequency resolution equal to my sampling rate, now I'm, I'm using only 4,096 samples. This is the maximum block size used in Vorbis. And this is only used at very low bit rates. And you can already see that it starts to leak some of the energy into surrounding bins. So we lose the sense of, of knowing exactly what frequency our tones are at. And as you go down to a typical Vorbis block size, you can see the leakage starts to go up. And Vorbis can get away with that because it's encoding real music, and real music is not composed of, of pure tones. And so all of your signal is going to have some of this leakage anyway. But once you start going down much further than that, this is with only 256 samples, you can see the resolution starts to get very coarse. The, the two A notes that were an octave apart are now concentrated in that one peak. So we can't even distinguish that there's two different notes there. Um, and so the other problem is, is that this leakage is not stable over time. So if I look at the next 256 samples, I get something like this, where I don't even have the same number of peaks and things have jumped around, even though I'm, I'm sampling the same three pure tones. And so as you keep going, you have the, the same problem. And so this is what we're up against when, when trying, to, trying to develop a low delay codec. Is it the, in order to, to compensate for this, this frequency res poor frequency resolution, we have to do a number of things. And you have to spend a lot more bits in the low frequencies in order to capture those with enough quality. So the, 
the actual M in the MDCT stands for modified, and the reason for that is that the normal discrete cosine transform operates on a single block of samples, and then the next frame would operate on another disjoint block of samples, and each one is going to have independent coding artifacts. So the discontinuity between those two blocks is going to be very audible. So the, the idea of the modified discrete cosine transform, or MDCT, is that we use a, a decaying window to blend two adjacent blocks together. So we have some amount of overlap, and we put this window function in there, and so that way we blend smoothly from the artifacts in one block into the artifacts in the next block, and you don't hear that sharp discontinuity. Um, the MDCT is, is the exact same transform used in MP3 and, and Vorbis and AAC in basically most of the, the transform codecs out there. The one minor difference is that in KELT, we use less over, we use, well, we use much smaller blocks for one thing. We also have less overlap. So normally in the MDCT, the, the amount of decay in this window is equal to half your block size on each side. So the total number of samples in the block is, is twice the, the number of samples in, in a normal DCT. But in KELT, we actually set the, the samples at the edges there to zero so that we can get away with 25% overlap instead of 50%. And it gives you a small loss in quality, but it also gives you much better delay while still being able to avoid some of these artifacts. So now I want to talk about the constrained energy part. So in order to explain how this works, you need to know what, what critical bands are. So this is something that comes out of our psychoacoustic models of the human ear. And the human ear can hear about 25 distinct critical bands in the frequency domain. And what that means is that if there's a strong tone in one of these bands, then a weak tone in the same band is inaudible. And so if you look at the, the graph here at the bottom, the red line is the, the threshold of hearing. So anything below that line is inaudible. <coughs> and then the, the black lines represent if you add a masker equal to one critical bandwidth at one kilohertz at various energy levels, that's how much louder a sound has to be for you to be able to detect it nearby. Now, this is not the same thing as saying if you had two strong tones next to each other, you know, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. You can. It's just saying that if you have a strong tone and a weak tone next to it, then the strong tone makes the weak tone inaudible. And that curve shows you how, how weak the tone ha can be before it becomes inaudible. So we're going to group the, the MDCT coefficients that we get out of that transform into bands that approximate these critical bands. And this is done along something known as the Bark scale. The Bark scale is roughly logarithmic, so you have much smaller critical bands at the low end, and then at the high end of your frequency range, they start to get much larger, and you get lots more coefficients than them. Um, in KELT, we actually limit the number of, of coefficients in each band to be at least three, just to minimize the per band overhead in our codec. But that means that at the low end, we have insufficient frequency resolution to get to describe all of the, these critical bands. That turns out not to be terribly important because we have to wind up spending lots of bits on the low frequencies anyway. And so we're, we're already going to get most of the, most of the artifacts that, that this constrained energy idea would conceal, we're not going to have in the low frequency bands. On the high frequency bands, on the other hand, is very different in that the last band there can have 50 to 100 coefficients in it. When we operate in stereo mode, it can have as many. We just throw all the channels into one big band. And so you can have 200 coefficients in that last frequency band. And we're going to wind up spending very, very few bits to encode a huge number of coefficients because of this idea of constrained energy. Because basically, all we'll have to do is specify the energy. So all this comes from the most important lesson we learned when we were designing Vorbis, was that you have to preserve the energy in each band. And this, before, before in the early days of MP3 and before MP3, people spent a lot of time trying to optimize for mean squared error as an error measurement. That turns out to be an incredibly bad idea. 
And one of the things we found out when, when, when designing Vorbis is that you really want to make sure that when you're quantizing all these coefficients, you don't reduce them down to, to zero and, and lose all the energy in one of these bands. And so Vorbis the, in the encoder side actually spends extra bits to make sure that that doesn't happen. Because we can code the energy explicitly, we don't have to do that. We're going to mathematically constrain the codec to output something with the correct energy. Uh, and so that, that so in, to code that energy, we basically split it up into two pieces. One is called the coarse energy, which will be at, at six decibels of resolution. And we predict that from the previous frame and the previous band. So that prediction helps us save a number of bits, around 28 bits per frame, which turns into a big savings when you're sending almost 200 frames a second. It's, so it's about 5.6 kilobits per second. Um, after we've coded the coarse energy, then we code fine energy. And the resolution of the fine energy varies from band to band. So we'll spend more bits on that at the low end. And that's basically just to Im improve the frequency resolution because be since we're constraining the energy output to be exactly what we code, if we don't give it a high resolution, if we make an error here, there's no way, no matter how many bits we spend on the rest of the signal, there's no way we'd be able to recover if we didn't have these fine energy bits. So you can see some of the effects of doing this. If you look at a comparison between uh, Kelts and, and an original signal. So Kelts is in green, the original signal is in red. It's unfortunately kind of hard to see in this projector. But if you look between 8.5 kilohertz and 12 kilohertz here, you can see we get roughly the energy level right, but we haven't bothered to say where within that band the energy is distributed. And basically our psychoacoustic models tell us you can't tell the difference. And so so that's where we're, we're really saving lots of information. But on the, on the other hand, at the low frequency where we, say, where we know you can tell the difference, you can see we match up very well, and you get lots of this yellow as the, these things overlap. So it turns out that, that speech is intelligible using coarse energy alone. So that, that requires about 9 kilobits per second of, of data. And it turns out you can actually hear what somebody is saying. And hopefully on this audio system you'll be able to make it out, but... To administer medicine to animals is frequently a very difficult matter, and yet sometimes it's necessary to do so. The simplest method is to mix the medicine with butter or some other grease and smear it on the nose of the animal from time to time. So that's 9 kilobits per second of data, which is not very much. But... So once we've coded the energy, we now need to code the rest of the details of the signal, so how that energy is distributed. And this is, this is the band shape. So we're going to normalize each band by the, by the energy, the real energy, not necessarily the one we encoded. And that gives you this n-dimensional unit vector, which can also be thought of as a point on an n-dimensional sphere, where n is the number of coefficients that are in each band. So that varies from band to band. But this, is, this unit vector is going to describe the shape of the energy, or its distribution within the band. So we break this up and code this shape using two pieces. One, an adaptive code vic use, using previously decoded signal content. So we're basically going to look at the past history of the signal and use that to come up with some predictor for the current signal. And the other is a fixed codec, fixed code book which handles the, the part of the signal that we can't predict, that doesn't look like the, the previous signal. And the latter uses this idea of vector quantization. So I'm going to explain what that means. The idea of, of vector quantization is to approximate a multidimensional distribution with a finite number of code words. So if you look at, at the left, we have a distribution here in two dimensions where basically that, that looks like the, these two big groups here. If you do scalar quantization, you're, you're considering each point independent, each dimension independently. And so you would sum up all the, the points on the columns or sum up all the points on the rows and look at that distribution and code, code that independently. 
And if we were going to operate at two bits per dimension, we would have 16 total code words, and you get something like that nice grid there. Uh, unfortunately, you can see that's not a very efficient use of our code space. The, the point at the, at the upper left and the point down at the lower right actually aren't used for any code words at all, so we've wasted an eighth of them because there's, there's, no, there's no data that actually falls in those bins. Vector quantization, on the other hand, allows you to basically specify your, your code book as arbitrary vectors in, in this space. So in this case, you'd have two-dimensional vectors for each code word, which correspond to all these red points. And now you can see we get much, much closer to the actual distribution of the data we have, which in turn reduces the average error that we get in quantizing the data. And so this, the basic idea of vector quantization, the way it's, it's commonly implemented, is that you'll take a bunch of training data like this here, and you'll do some clustering on it, and, and basically train these code books and have a big table that says, here, here are all of my possible vectors. And then when you do the encoding, you search through the whole table and say, which one matches best? Unfortunately, that's not going to work very well for us. Um, the other nice, nice feature of, of vector quantization is that you can easily scale down to less than one bit per dimension. So if you tried to do one, half a bit per dimension with scalar quantization, you get something on the left, where we basically had to fix one of the dimensions at a constant value, and then we have one bit left over to, to code the other dimension, and you, basic, you get two points that aren't anywhere near your actual distribution. Whereas if you do vector quantization, you can actually pick which which points, you know, pick two points that fall right in the center of your, your clumps there and get much better, much better error. Um, so, unfortunately, we can't do this idea of training our code books and, and making these big tables. And the reason is that we require a lot of code books. So every band can have a different number of dimensions, so we'd have to have a different code book for every one. And the exact number of bits that we want to use in each band varies from packet to packet. So any time the number of bits changes, we would have to change the number of code words in our code book, which means we need a co new code book. So the other problem is that we require very large code books. So the, s the size of your code book is exponential in number of dimensions if you keep the if you keep the rate per dimension fixed. So if you have 50 dimensions, which we do in our, in our last bands, in the high frequency bands, at only 0.6 bits per dimension, you require over a billion code book entries, which even if you have one byte per dimension is 50 gigabytes of data. We actually obviously can't store a code book that large. And even if we could, we couldn't possibly search it in real time. But we do know that we have uniformly distributed unit vectors. It turns out if you make, if you make some mild assumptions about the, the statistics of your input, you can show that, that your unit vector is going to be points evenly distributed on a sphere. And so what that means is we can use a regularly structured algebraic code book. And the one we use in particular is called pyramid vector quantization. And so we, we want to represent points that are evenly distributed on a sphere, but we don't actually know how to do that in, in an arbitrary dimension. Um, it turns out to be much easier to use evenly distributed points on a pyramid and then project those onto the sphere. So for an n-dimensional vector, we're going to allocate k pulses. And then the code book consists of vectors whose integer coordinates sum up to k. And so we just take the absolute value of each, co of each coordinate, and if those sum up to k, that's a point in our code book. And it turns out that this has a fast enumeration algorithm, so we can convert between this, this full vector and its index in this code book. If we had put all the code words in a big table, it would tell you what, what table entry it was in, in only order n plus k. The, um, that particular algorithm requires you to build a small lookup table and use some, or use some multiplications. But it turns out there's an even simpler algorithm that just runs in, in order nk, which is slightly worse, but only requires addition. And so that's very good for cheap hardware that doesn't have fast multipliers or a lot of RAM for, for table lookups. 
Um, there's also a fast codebook search algorithm. So instead of having to scan through all possible code words and figure out which one is the best, it turns out you, if you just divide by the L1 norm, so the sum of the absolute values, and round down, that tells you where to place at least k minus n of the pulses. And then you can place the remaining pulses at most n one at a time just by doing a greedy optimization, saying which one reduces my error the, the best each time. Um, we also allow codebooks larger than 32 bits uh, because we don't want to do 32 bit, we don't want to do 64 bit arithmetic because it turns out to be quite expensive. For that, we wind up splitting the vector in half and coding each half separately. Since it's used so rarely, that adds some small amount of, over, of overhead, but it turns out to not be that much. Um, so the adaptive piece comes from this idea of using pitch prediction. So because we have these short block sizes, as I said, we have poor frequency resolution. But speech and music have, have periodic stationary content. So if you have a, a solo instrument hitting a single note, that shows up as a very definite periodic signal. And, and speech also, also is often, can often be represented that way. But because we have such poor frequency resolution, we can't accurately represent what that period is. As you saw before, we had two notes that were an octave apart, and they fell into the same MDCT bin. So pitch prediction is going to allow you to compensate for that. So what we do is search the past 1,024 decoded samples and code the offset of the best match. And this offset is defining what the period is of this periodic signal. So our resolution there then becomes equal to the sampling rate, because we've coded this explicit offset in the number of samples. And that operates at a range of frequencies between about 47 hertz to 125 hertz at when using 40, 48 kilohertz signal. Um, we also can get improved resolution, though not quite at the sampling rate, for any multiple of that. So just because you can have something that's, you have two periods in the same range. And so, so this, helps, this helps a lot with speech, and it helps a lot of, at low bit rates. It hasn't shown to be terribly helpful much above that. But, but since those speech and low bit rates are two pretty important cases, we include it in the codec. So once we found this, this match in our past history, we apply an MDCT to that to convert it to the frequency domain just like our, our coded signal. And then we're going to confine our prediction to bands below 8 kilohertz. And the reason for that is that above approximately that, that cutoff, the, the signal is basically never periodic. And so the, the prediction hurts more than it helps. So once we have this predictor, we want to mix this with our, our fixed codebook vectors. So we're going we're to scale the, the predictor to a unit vector, which I'll call p, and then compute a pitch gain in the range of 0 to 1 for every band. And then the, the final reconstructed signal is just, is just the gain times our pitch predictor plus another gain times our, our, our fixed codebook vector y here. And because we, want, we know we want the output to have unit norms so that we can scale up by the energy and get the energy back, it turns out that the fixed codebook gain is completely determined by this horribly complicated expression here. So what does that actually do to our codebooks? So if you look at the, the top here, this is what the, the fixed codebooks look like in three dimensions for varying numbers of bits. So as you increase the number of code words, you can see the, the resolution goes up on on each of those, those spheres. Now, if you apply the, the, the pitch predictor, what you're basically doing is shifting that codebook along the direction of the pitch vector. So if, if, you, look, if you look over here on, on the far right, you can see the density of points around that plane perpendicular to the pitch vector, which is where we'd expect our, our codebook, co our actual vector to be the actual signal we want to code to be, is, is much, much tighter because we've actually moved all of the points that used to be circling the equator of the circle up there. So we have a much better density. And that means that we have much less error in our signal for the same rate, or equivalently that we can encode something with, with fewer bits to get the same error.
So if we wanted to code the, the point up there with the little blue x, you would choose your, your gain value so that the residual, that is the, the difference between that point and your scaled pitch vector, would be orthogonal to the pitch vector. Unfortunately, we're going to have to quantize that gain because we can't represent it exactly because that would require an infinite number of bits. And that means that this orthogonality is not going to be quite exact. So we used to use basic vector quantization to code all of the gain values at once. So the same, we collected a bunch of training data and then searched a table. It was only 128 entries long, so it was actually feasible. But we actually found it was better to use one bit per band to just specify whether the gain is either 0 or 0.9. And the, the basic reason is that you either want to use a lot of prediction and get that big benefit, or it's not going to be worth the, the bits it takes to, to code it. So there are a few more final details that didn't quite fit in any of the previous categories, but are important to talk about. Um, we only support constant bit rate. So the reason for that is because variable bit rate requires buffering because you, you have to have a large enough network buffer to absorb all of the, the variation in your packet sizes, and that means more delay. Um, so basically, the user specifies the exact number of bytes to encode, and we hand them back that many bytes. But that can change from packet to packet, so we do allow some flexibility if, if your channel rate changes. Uh, but really, in each packet, only a few things are variable size any, anyway, the coarse energy, the, the pitch parameters, because we can, they're not actually variable size, but we can emit them. And if, if, the, if our vector quantization codebook goes over 32 bits, the result, one, each side winds up being, once we split it, winds up being variable size. But the other interesting thing is that we fix the number of bits we hand to each band. So we, after those variable size, there's a certain number of bits left, and we divide them up proportionally over given to a predetermined allocation. What that means is that we don't, have to, we don't have to transmit any bits to say how we allocated something. And since we're sending 200 packets a second, that becomes rather important, because any, any extra side information would be quite expensive. This turns out to be roughly equivalent to modeling masking within each critical band, but we're ignoring masking in between bands. And we also, also ignore tone versus noise effects. So tone is Pure tones are much weaker maskers than, than broad spectrum noise. Um, we also do a couple of extra tricks that, that avoid some common artifacts. Uh, if you have, in the, high, in the high frequency bands, if you have a very small K, so you're using a very small number of pulses, most of your coefficients are going to be zero. So we use this idea of spectral folding, where we scale a copy of the lower frequency coefficients and use that in place of the pitch predictor, because we know the pitch predictor doesn't work very well. And what this is really doing is acting as a cheap source of time localized noise. So we mix it using a, a very small value for, th for the pitch gain, which is a function of the number of pulses. So as you add more pulses, we lo lower the noise floor. Uh, and that helps avoid these, these birdie artifacts that show up when you have a very sparse spectrum in the high frequencies. Um, the other thing we do is avoid pre-echo artifacts. Basically, transform codecs because any artifact is distributed over an entire frame, regardless of, of where this, of where the energy in that frame is is concentrated. If you have, you know, a strong transient in the second half of the frame and the first half of the frame is very quiet, you'll actually hear effects of the the transient before it shows up. And so when we detect one of those situations, we actually split the frame into n smaller pieces, do an MDCD on, on each piece, and interleave the coefficients, and we just continue as normal, which is totally mathematically, you know, psychoacoustically incorrect, but works well enough. Uh, so a basic block di diagram of the entire encoder. We start over on the input. We apply our, our window to blend blocks together and then do an MDCT. The, the band energy up at the top gets encoded as Q1. Q stands for quantizer. So that's, that's the quantized band energy and passed to the decoder. 
Meanwhile, we divide out by the band energy in each of the MDCT coefficients. And then we have in, in the full KELT, we have this pitch predictor. Pitch predictor is disabled in low complexity mode, but otherwise they're identical. So th the pitch predictor tries to estimate the pitch period and transmits that. And then on, the on both the encoder and decoder, we, we compute the MDCT of that, of that estimated predictor and use that to compute the pitch gains. So the pitch gains get transmitted over as, as GA and are removed from the MDCT coefficients we have. And then the residual gets quantized using vector quantization, as this goes with Y. And then on the decoder side, we mix those two back together, do our inverse MDCT, and then apply the window to do weighted overlap adding. So there's lots of, of stuff we have left to do. Basically, this is a, a research codec, so we haven't formalized the bitstream format yet. Uh, because we send no side information, that means lots of the details on the encoding side become normative, as in you, you have to do the exact same thing on the decoding side or they won't match, which basically means we break the bitstream almost every commit. Um, we've looked into doing some dynamic rate allocation, but it's difficult because psychoacoustic analysis is hard to do without adding any extra delay. And as I said, almost any per band overhead uses a lot of bits. We also want to do some stuff to improve stereo coupling and pitch prediction. Um, so now to go ahead and look at some of the performance results. These were actually done not by us, but by Dr. Christian Hahn for an ITU workshop last September. And it's comparing Kelt uh, against a, a couple of simpler things. So rate limited is just downsampling your signal. And A law and mu law are, are two simple things that operate sample by sample. So these aren't real codecs. SBC, on the other hand, is a codec used in Bluetooth. So Bluetooth headsets and such use that. And, and as you can see, SBC you can get to get about the quality of KELT, but it uses a heck of a lot more bits. So it's really not in the same class. Um, he also compared some stuff against AAC and against MP3. And so this is using an objective quality measure called PAQ instead of real listening tests. And, and as you can see, even though we have a slightly higher delay than ULD, in this test it got 50% more bits and still sounded much worse. And this graph uses that, that same objective measure to show you how quality is affected as you lower delay. So the, the frame size on the bottom is, is directly proportional to your delay. And the, the bit rate on the, the right shows you how much you have to increase it to, to keep the same quality. So each, each, of these, each of these ISO contours is constant quality. And this is really why you want to have an objective measure, because this represents something like 100,000 different evaluations of different parameters of the codec to generate a graph like this, which is qu completely impossible with listening tests. However, listening tests are important, so we've also done some of those. Um, so this is the full complexity version of KELP back in version 0.32. And as you can see, we were the, at 48 kilobits per second, we were the best of the bunch, uh, including beating MP3 which was designed for high latency, which we were actually rather surprised at. But at 64 kilobits per second, there, the results are roughly the same, except that now AACLD catches up with us. But the, it's statistically insignificant which one is better than the other. Uh, we also tested low complexity mode, where we disable the pitch predictor, because that saves lots of computation. Uh, this is totally bitstream compatible with using pitch. It just is much cheaper. And this time, we actually had some ULD samples. We got someone to send some of those to us. As you can see, even though, again, it had 50% more bits than the 64-bit version we tested of, our, of KELT, it still performed much worse. And, as, and our, our 96 kilobit version of KELT performed much even better than that. 
Uh, one of the things you have to worry about a lot when you're working with low delay is packet loss because there's no time to retransmit anything. This, this basically shows you how gracefully it degrades even though we're doing the simplest packet loss concealment ever. Uh, but and as you can see, when you disable the pitch predictor, you get slightly better correct. You s get slightly better quality in the face of packet loss. Uh, if you're doing wireless communications, you actually have to deal with bit errors that corrupt your packets without dropping the whole packet. And so we actually looked at how badly quality is impaired depending on the bit position that that the error occurs at. And so this graph is showing the, the effect of 50% loss at each position. And the reason is that trellis coded modulation, which is a commonly used modulation type, allows you to give much better protection to the bits at the beginning of the packet. So by having a nice monotonically increasing curve here, we actually take advantage of that. Uh, there's also a simple modification we plan to do that'll, flat, that'll flatten out that knee there and get the quality all the way up in front of that, but that hasn't gone in yet. Um, I just want to play a couple of examples. So starting off with the original file. If you do scalar quantization, you get annoying background hiss. This is just dropping off the, the low end bits on every sample. But now, Kelt encoded the exact same signal to noise ratio. It sounds like this. What's also interesting is if you listen to the residual, the difference between the encoded signal and the original one. So for scalar quantization, you just get this horrible hiss. And that's all the extra energy being added to these high frequencies until the end where it falls below the quantization threshold. Meanwhile, Kelt, you can hear we're throwing away real information, but we're only doing it in places where there's something else in the signal to mask that. So I don't have very much time to talk about LibKelt, but just a few things. It's Extremely lightweight, uh, the, basically the entire codec fits in L1 cache. Uh, so we don't even bother to lock pages when we're doing real-time stuff just because if your kernel actually swaps out something that's that small being called 200 times a second, it's broken. Uh, and so there's, also, there's a f both a fixed point and a floating point version. The floating point version uses less than 1% of one core on a core 2 processor. Uh, I don't have too much time to go into detail in the about the API, but the, the slides will be on the web later. And I wanted to make a couple of comments about low latency Linux audio. We had s some problem with hardware that doesn't work for small buffer sizes. And basically, 256 samples will sometimes fail, and there's real, no real way to tell that it's going to fail other than to try it and see it doesn't work. And I don't know if that's a hardware problem or a driver problem, but the fact that you can't tell in advance is, is a Linux problem. And even if small buffers work, you have real problems with scheduling delays. So the real-time patches help a lot, but stuff like loading and unloading drivers, so plugging in a USB headset, for example, often causes a huge delay and virtually guarantees that you'll start dropping packets. And network latency is also a real problem. So I actually had this, the wireless driver in this laptop, if you send 200 packets a second, Suddenly, your ping times start going up as it throttles interrupts, and it's easily it's easy to get several seconds of ping time, which obviously obviously does not help low delay. <laughs> and other Wi-Fi drivers have odd things like you'll just occasionally get spikes over 100 milliseconds, and that causes packet loss. Um, so I've set up a demo, which I think we'll now switch to as we we reach the end of our time. And there's a laptop outside in the hall. So if somebody wants to go out and try that, we should be able to hook it up to this laptop here. And I, 
I've got a microphone up here if someone wants to come up and, and, and try talking over you. Are you there? That's bad. I heard you, but <laughs> over the microphone out there. Oh. Not yet, we can't. Not working yet. Uh, hmm. Bill Gates is oh. laughing at this moment. Let me close XMMS. <laughs> How about that? Yes. <laughs> you, you plugged the microphone into the headphone socket. That might have had something to do with it. Oh, that would obviously have <laughs> So. You want me to sing? No. No one wants to sing. You want me to sing? Okay. Yeah, let's sing. You want to do one more uh, I can do better than that. All right. And did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains green? Yep. <laughs> Louder, quieter, something else? More? Okay. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. Uh, actually, no. There, there's too, there was too much packet loss in here. We tried it yesterday. I, I checked it out to make sure it would work. And when everybody fills up the room, there's too much packet loss to do it over Wi-Fi. Yeah, so this, that's, that's the router here with the cable going out. But. Hmm? Uh, that, was, that was 64 kilobits a second. So they're actually horrible quality mics. So even if it's not a demonstration of quality, that's just a demonstration of latency. But, um, so I also should have... Hmm? Um, so that, that was 8 milliseconds on, on the codec side. I haven't measured the total end-to-end -end latency. But so I should have the, the main uh, author of Speaks on the other end, if he's here. Um, so he's in Canada, so that this will not be very low latency, but let's see if we can go get him on the line. Hello? Hi, Sylvia. <laughs> uh, so I guess I'll turn this over to questions. You can ask them either, either of me or of Jean-Marc. Hi, everyone. Uh, we can try it. Uh, the latency is probably going to be quite high. You want to, you want to do it, John? I'm sorry? Y you want to sing Row, Row, Row Your Boat? Uh, I'm not quite sure. Well, we can try. <laughs> <laughs> Just to demonstrate high latency? Yeah, but this is scaled. It's supposed to be really low latency anyway. Well, yes. Regardless of the network. Yeah, you're, you're, you're several continents away. <laughs> <laughs> so you want, 
You want to try that? Let's do it. Okay. Row, 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 row your, your boat, boat gently, gently down, down the <laughs> street. Yeah. As, as you can see, it doesn't work very well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, are there any questions for us? Um, they're actually exactly the same, same settings. There's a jitter buffer that tries to figure out what the latency is and compensate for that. Uh, well, yeah, it's still 64, bil 64 kilobits per second with 8 milliseconds of, of codec delay and then a whole lot of network delay stacked on that. Yes? So the question is, have how is it possible? We actually have 260 milliseconds of round trip delay, so that explains a bit uh, the latency <laughs> we've had. Yeah, so how is it possible that we avoided patents was the question. Um, and it turns out that there are, there are a lot of things that, that were done far enough in the past that they can't possibly be patented now for one. Uh, for example, the vector quantization stuff, we actually invented a lot of the machinery to do that kind of algebraic quantization ourselves. And then Jean-Marc completely randomly while researching something else found a paper on it from 1986 that did everything we did. And so there were some minor differences in our implementation, but we switched to that one expressly because it was, it was so old. Basically, that's a part where I, I was asking Derf if he could um, <coughs> work around an existing patent that I knew about. And he came up with something that did exactly the same thing well, that gave the same result, but in a different way. And eventually, yeah, we just realized that what he had invented had actually been invented about 20 years earlier. So we were safe regarding patents. Yes, which made us happy, which is not usual in academic circles when you find out <laughs> you've been scooped. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and the, the other thing is with, with multimedia patents is that details really matter. And if you go look at these things, the actual scope of a new invention is often very, very, very narrow. And if you can figure out exactly what that is, it's possible to do something that's kind of almost the same and gives you somewhat of a similar result, <laughs> but doesn't infringe on the patent. And also, especially in the case of Codex, what happens is most of those patents are actually written specifically for one particular standard. So since CELT is not derived from any of those standards, then it's much easier to avoid those patents simply because we're not exactly this codec. Yes? Um, Can someone repeat the yeah, question? Yeah, so we haven't actually tested it. We haven't actually compared it directly with Vorbis. Uh, we did compare it against MP3 in our listening tests and found out we were better. But if you look at the, the graph here that, that plots bit rate versus, versus latency and quality versus, versus those, you can see that once you start getting at about 512 sample frames, the, the improvements go down. And that's, that's when it starts stuff like dynamic allocation and being able to do real psychoacoustic modeling are start to give you a real benefit. And because we're not doing any of that, we don't, don't improve. Yes. Uh, could people refrain from using the wireless network or the network in the room because it seems like the number uh, of packet loss has gone up quite a bit? That we're actually <laughs> using the wired network, John, so, Jean-Marc. Oh, so okay. <laughs> I can barely hear you. I don't know if you can hear me. So about comparing CELT and Vorbis, I think that's what the question was about. Uh, I did some very quick comparisons just listening to the results. And um, it turned out that obviously CELT wasn't as good as Vorbis for the same bit rate that was expected. It was, however, not that far away. I think uh, CELT at 80 kilobits per second was a bit similar to um, Vorbis at around 64. So you were saying? Mm -hmm. 
So, yeah, that would be very nice. <laughs> yeah, so the, the basic gist of it was that they're working on getting threaded interrupt response stuff into the kernel so that you can actually get much better latency in response to some of these USB issues. Right, so, yeah, if we can get the USB handler to not lock everything for hundreds of milliseconds, that will make, make things much better. Yes? Um, so you can actually do this. So yeah, so the question is what networks exist with that can send these things at this low latency? You can actually do this with a lot of the, the basically home broadband connections in, in some parts of the US and, and a lot of Europe. So some of the stuff I, I didn't get a chance to talk about. We have a number of, of people who have already started adopting KELT, despite the fact that we haven't frozen the bitstream or anything like that. <laughs> and uh, one of that is, is this guy, Alexander Corot, who's doing an application called Soundjack. And that's been used to do live music performances across Europe in, in distributed locations. Um, there are a few other here, a couple of voice over IP applications. And we're actually already in NetJack, which is part of, 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 of the Jack audio connection kit. And we're actually also being used in uh, a radio broadcast in Canada where they're using KELT to transmit from the studio to their FM transmitter over a microwave link. So, yes? Um, I actually so use CELT. Yeah, so Jean-Marc uses CELT. I use KELT. I mean, <laughs> people... The, the, the actual, no. yeah, so the, the actual Celtic or Celtic people, you know, get also the, both terms are used for the pronunciation of that, so I don't think it, t it matters terribly much. <laughs> yes? Um, so we had looked at actually trying to get a draft standard published in, in March which of a frozen bitstream, but it now looks like that probably won't actually happen, so we may take some t extra time and do some more experimenting. Uh, Jean-Marc, how far do you think we are from, from, from freezing the bitstream format? Uh, it's not quite clear yet. There's a few issues to, to resolve, and it depends how long it's going to take, but it's, it's not going to be within you know, the next month or two, but I think it's going to be less than one year. That's about as precise as I can yeah. as yes. I can be for that. Jean-Marc, do you have a music sample to play? Uh, nope. <laughs> 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 All right then. Yes. Uh, so the code is at celtcodec.org or keltcodec.org. Pick, take your pick. Um, I don't think I actually have the URL in the presentation, which is probably a grave oversight. Cell-codec.org. Yes, yes. So if you put if you put Kelt and Codec into Google, it will show up. Kelt by itself, unfortunately, will not, because there's this strange race of people named it. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. So I think that's all the questions.